and welcome to the 495. I am your host, Doug Sparks, editor-in-chief of Merrimack Valley Magazine. Lou, how are you doing this week? I'm already sunlight deprived and, <laughs> uh, and warm sun deprived, but I guess it's nice out, right? Got, got it, got, you yeah. got to get that vitamin D when yeah. you have a chance, otherwise you have to take it in the, uh, the multivitamin. Yeah, this will be the first night, I think, this year that when I leave work, it's going to be dark. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's changing. Hey, did you... Um, did you get a chance to check out the Charlie Baker press conference this morning? No. Did you, I, did you hear anything about it? I was working this it? morning. No, I haven't. So it was in Lowell. Yep. Uh, and he, he did it live from uh, Mill City Barbecue. And oh, did he? he had uh, Renee Walterding, who was on the show oh, a few no. weeks ago, on as a guest. Uh, it was actually pretty interesting. They're going to open up a um, uh, Black History walking tour or walking tours in Lowell mm -hmm. yep. that's going to lead to different businesses. Uh, so I think that's pretty fascinating. I had no idea that was going to happen. I love walking. It's you know like my favorite yeah. you know activity so i'm that's excited that's all it took to get me going on barbecue now <laughs> yeah i, I know i may I'm, drive to lola set <laughs> yeah yeah but they so he's also yeah. relaxing the restaurant rules so he got into that oh, so good. now in in massachusetts now you can have 10 people at a table uh so he and that that was and then uh you can sit at the bar now for food bars and nightclubs still not open but you can sit at the bar now oh, and, so they can put seating food. at the bar you can put seating at the bar so it was it yeah, was okay. kind of i think yeah. some restaurant people were pretty happy with today's news yeah good. but the, the neat thing was that renee was on yeah who uh, a friend of the show uh <laughs> so our guest today is john broderick he's a former chief justice of the new hampshire supreme court he is uh the um a former uh, dean at franklin pierce college and he's the senior director of external affairs at dartmouth Hitchcock Health. John, can you hear me? I hear you fine. Doug. Good oh, to be with you. Yeah, great to be with you. Uh, the first thing, actually, I want to dig on is uh, dig in on is um, just your thoughts about the path, the passing of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg last week. Uh, it's a huge loss uh, for the country. Mm -hmm. um, she had a remarkable personal story of growth and change. Uh, she's been advocating for equal rights, not just for women, but especially for women. And she is, uh, she was uh, intolerant of discrimination of any kind. Mm. And she became an icon uh, for a lot of young women in this country. And so it's a sad day to, to lose someone of her stature. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on, on the future of the Supreme Court and what's, what we're in yeah. store for in the coming weeks and months? Well, what, what concerns me is not so much uh, the immediate struggle that's going on. That's about politics. Mm -hmm. What bothers me uh, and continues to bother me is that I do not want the Supreme Court of this country to be seen as an extension of partisan politics. And I think that's been slowly happening over the last 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And in time... Um, people will lose respect for his decisions because they will be perceived to be uh, just a product of politics, and that's not the role of the courts in America. So I worry about that, Doug. Sure. Hey, w when you were um, teaching law school, do you, do you think you had a, a, a judicial philosophy? Was there something in, like an essence of the way you kind of looked at the process you know, people uh, people ask that question, and I, I don't want to disappoint you. The answer is I didn't. Hmm. Uh, the, the best judging I think you can do at almost any level is to understand the facts before you, understand the legal principles that apply, and do your level best to apply them. Um, at the Supreme Court of the United States, since they are the last word, on the federal constitution and federal statutes and regulations. It, it may be more significant there than anywhere else. But I was on the state Supreme Court. I was chief justice there for seven years. Um, and my job was to understand the case, understand the case law, uh, and all the legal niceties that touch it, whether it's statutes or regulations or constitutions, and do my level best to apply them. And sometimes because of that, uh, uh, people don't believe this often, but it's true. Sometimes I would author opinions that I personally disagreed with. Hmm. But it's not about me. It's about what the law has said. And changes should be incremental so that people can get some sense of the evolution of the law in the world in which they live. So 
if you had whiplash reading cases and they kept changing year to year, uh, that would not be good for the judicial process. It wouldn't be good for the people. So sometimes because of precedent, which had been long established, I would apply it because I didn't have any compelling reason not to other than I disagreed with it. And that can't be the test. Yeah. So on paper, you, you seem to almost have had two lives in terms of your career. You have a part of your career that was centered around justice and the justice system and the and teaching of, of law and health. Are these things connected in any way? You know, in an odd way, uh, I think they are connected uh, in this sense. And I say this pretty humbly, believe me. Mm -hmm. I was a civil trial lawyer for 22 years. And my job was to find justice as best I could discern it. Uh, from the uh, courts. Uh, then I became an appellate judge, and my job was to oversee the justice system in New Hampshire with my colleagues when I was chief justice. And then I became dean of the law school, and my job there was to oversee the instruction of law for law students who would be entering the system. And now, in the mission I've been on for the last four and a half years, um, I feel I'm trying to find justice for those who are suffering for mental health issues and all those people who love those people. Uh, in some ways, uh, Doug, and I mean this sincerely, the work I've been doing the last four years is the most important justice work I've done in my entire professional life. So they are tied together, I think, by trying to find fairness for people. Yeah. So I, I'm going to hold up the article right now from the most recent issue of Merrimack Valley Magazine so people can read about it here. There's going to be people listening who, who haven't read this. Um, so for those people, how did you get interested in, in mental health? What was the path? Well, I'm a baby boomer, not that anyone could guess that. Uh, and as a baby boomer, having grown up uh, in that world, mental illness, uh, mental health, general, it, it wasn't discussed. Uh, now there was cancer, by the way, in my childhood, and, and AIDS wasn't given a lot of prominence until Magic Johnson said he had HIV. But mental illness has always been seen by the popular culture as something you don't talk about. It's awkward. Uh, or it's a character flaw or a personal weakness. Nobody talked about it, so I knew nothing about it. And then I have two sons, fully grown now. But when my oldest son then was 13, he started to develop mental health problems, which he didn't understand. Makes sense when you think about it. How would you know that? And we didn't see. Um, and so it got worse over time. And there were always common sense explanations. He's a very talented artist. So people would say, you know, artists, they're different. Creative people are different. They march to the beat of a different drummer. And there may be some truth to that, but it doesn't mean they're mentally ill. Mm -hmm. um, and then my son uh, started smoking in high school. I didn't know that. He had friends, but not as many as his younger brother, who was two years behind him. And then it really became more dominant when he went off to college, went to New York. And then on some of those weekend phone calls, when people made weekend phone calls, so they did at one time in my life. Uh, so he would make those calls and I would hear his voice and it sounded like it was slurring and he was drinking. Mm -hmm. And then I was alarmed by the level of his drinking and he kept saying, I don't have a drinking problem, Dad. If I didn't have these feelings, I, I wouldn't be drinking. He had a master's degree in Boston. He's really smart, handsome, talented. And eventually, he was having trouble getting his life going. And so my wife and I reached out for the obvious help, which seemed to be alcohol counseling. And we explained to them what we were seeing, what we had been witnessing, how it was really ruining his life. And they said to us, very matter-of-factly, he's an alcoholic. And so he would deny that, but it seemed obvious. And anyway, we went down that road, and that wasn't really his problem. Alcohol was a problem, but it was more a symptom hmm. of underlying mental illness. And my wife and I made choices based on that level of ignorance, which was well-intended, but it was wrong. And it ended up with my son, master's educated, talented guy, good guy, assaulting me. 
Uh, I went to the hospital. My son ended up going to the state prison. I was sitting on the Supreme Court then. And I wouldn't wish that nightmare on anyone alive. Hmm. And when he got to that place and they started to evaluate him, they told us at our first meeting that he had serious underlying mental health problems. He was seriously depressed. He had panic and anxiety that were virtually off the charts, and he had been self-medicating. Mm -hmm. And when they told us that, Doug, in that place, uh, I knew at that moment that we had failed him. I was, after all, a parent. I should have known something mm -hmm. about mental illness, but I, I hadn't. And uh, they said, we're going to work with him, see if we can turn his life around. And I thought that was impossible, to be honest. I thought all my illness was hopeless. I know that's not true at all now. And after about four months in the state prison, we visited him every week, twice a week. And he came out one night, gave us a big hug, as he always did. He said, Dad, I feel so different. Hmm. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm sleeping through the night, Dad, now. My mind doesn't seem to be racing. I can focus, Dad. I'm teaching here at the prison. And I said, what are you doing? What are they doing? He said, well, I see a counselor dad pretty regularly, and I take medication at night. And in the morning, I didn't know he could feel like this. Mm -hmm. And when he disclosed that to us, Doug, I knew that I should have known more, done more. And I harmed him, not, not deliberately, not intentionally, but my ignorance was not helpful. But in any event, I didn't do anything for a decade because it was still shameful, I thought. And in any event, about four or half, five years ago, I got a call one day from a psychologist in New Hampshire who said, hey, John, I have a good friend. She's a psychologist. She's in Maryland. She wants to start a national uh, public uh, campaign on mental health and mental wellness, and she wanted my friend, the psychologist, to get involved. She wanted New Hampshire to be the first state and having done nothing and said nothing for a decade, he asked me to co-chair it with him. And to my amazement, I said, sure, I'll do that. And so for the last almost four and a half years now, Doug, I've been speaking wherever and whenever I'm asked because we need to change the conversation and the culture around mental illness in this country which affects one in five adults and one in five kids. I hugged so many of them in my travels. And we don't have a mental health system in America. We don't have a mental health system in this country uh, because of people like I was, who didn't think it was a problem that was shared widely and who thought it was hopeless. It's, it's shared very widely, by the way, and it's far from hopeless. So that's what I've been doing in my life. And Dartmouth Titrock, by the way, for whom I now work, uh, without their help and support, I couldn't be doing it. And they helped me, by the way, and underwrote this a year or so before I ever went to work for them. And so they deserve as much credit as anyone, maybe more than most, because they see it, too. Yeah. So I, I, I do want to talk about the work you're 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 doing, but I also um you know and by the way, just to give people a sense of the time frame, I think uh, your son and I are the same age. He's forty eight, or he was when the article was written. I'm forty eight too. So just to give uh, people a sense of where he's at now in his his life, how's he doing now? Uh, he's a dramatically better person than he was. He his mental health issues. He takes medication every day. Mm -hmm. He's religious about it. And he knows why he's doing it, that if I didn't do this, I'd slide back. I'm sure I would. Uh, but he doesn't, he doesn't have life-interfering problems as he did. He has had a drop of alcohol in 15 years. He said to me, Dad, I don't need that now. I, at one point, if he had spent a night in the liquor store, Doug, he would have, he would have been intoxicated. He said, Dad, I can spend the night there. I might have a Coca-Cola I don't have that tug anymore in my life. I don't need that uh, anymore. And what has been most rewarding to me, Doug, is his strong support for what I'm doing. Hmm. Every single time I go out and speak, often at schools, he'll say, Dad, how'd it go today? And I'll tell him. And he said, I'm really proud, Dad, of what you're doing. I wish we had known the signs when I was 15. 
And I wish I had known the science too. Yeah. What worked for him? Was it was it more of a conventional sort of, I guess you'd call maybe like a Western approach with psychiatry, maybe therapy, medication? Yes. Uh, what, was there alternative, like, you know, was he doing sort of mindfulness training and meditation and, and cognitive he was, treating? He was and, and doesn't. Uh, that's not to say that those aren't important. Hmm. And different things work for different people. Uh, there's no silver bullet. There's no one prescription or one practice. But in his case, since he was where he was and since that's what they were doing, uh, it turned him around. Hmm. Uh, and so I think he stuck with what's worked. That's not to suggest it's the only thing that can work. Yeah. So uh, when this when this happened and there was there's this assault, there was a lot of media attention. How did that affect your family? Uh, it was really hard, harder, I think, on my wife and my oldest son and certainly my younger son. Um, I was in the hospital for three weeks. I was in intensive care for seven days. Uh, it was all over the national news. My doctors went on the Today Show uh, when I was in ICU and in intensive care. Uh, my wife is an amazing person, strong beyond belief, and my son, who ended up going to the Valley Street Jail, which is not a place you want to go, and you don't want to go there if your father's a judge. I, I, it's just a hard place. He endured three and a half years or three years in the state prison. I don't know that I could have done that. Uh, he's, he's amazing. He's amazing. My wife was extraordinary. And so I didn't have to deal with the immediate aftermath, of, but my wife did. Hmm. And she is the reason I'm convinced that our family survived and healed. It could have had the exact opposite effect. And so I feel very blessed that we healed. And I feel fortunate that with Dartmouth Hitchcock's help, I've been able to spread the gospel, so to speak. Um, and when I go out and speak, I don't tell people uh, how smart I am because I was very ignorant, and I am not the hero of the story that I relate. Uh, but it has so opened my eyes. It's opened my eyes, and if we don't start dealing with the talking about it, normalizing it, demythologizing it, nothing will change. Well, the, you know, this is, this is a little bit of what I want to get into uh, with you, because it's so interesting that you had this this situation that was so difficult on many levels. You had this media attention and it was kind of tough on your family. And the reaction was not to withdraw, not to kind of become a hermit and, you know, lick your wounds, but to actually become more public with your experiences. I mean, that must be that like, why did you decide? Was there a point where you said I can kind of become a hermit and we're going to kind of close off as a family or I'm going to to go out and become public with this and speak and, and connect with people over this issue? It, it, I wish I could say it happened because I had some internal transformation. Hmm. I had an opportunity. Hmm. And for the decade after this happened, like, people would come up to me, and particularly in the first year or two. My son was in the prison. And they would say, hey, Judge, you're looking good. I wouldn't even know these people, but they recognized me. And I would say, well, thank you. I knew what they meant. And uh, I said, my son's doing better now, too. And they wouldn't want to talk about that. And I would say, that's OK. He had mental health problems. He's a great guy. He just wasn't well. He's doing much better now. And then every one of those people, the strangers, would open up. My mother, my father, my cousin, my sister, myself, my best friend. It was everywhere. And and I realized that we hadn't been alone down there in the Valley of Mental Illness. There were a lot of people, but I didn't do anything. And when I finally had the chance to get involved in this campaign, which was a product of a genius psychologist in Maryland, Barbara Van Dalen, uh, she wanted to let everyone know the five basic signs of mental illness, like we know the signs for heart attack or stroke. And then Dartmouth Hitchcock took it one step higher by saying, how do we react if we find those signs? Mm -hmm. And so because I knew others were suffering and because I wanted finally to heal, I thought it was essential that I talked about it. Um, and I tell you this, I, I've spoken 520 times before the virus mm -hmm. in 230 or 250 schools throughout New England. Uh, some of them here in Massachusetts. Uh, 
some to schools as young as sixth, seventh graders. It doesn't matter, tell you where you speak. It doesn't matter. The kids who, once they hear my story and know that I won't judge them or blame them or shame them, they will talk to me in ways that have so changed me. And it's made me pretty impatient about creating a system and a culture that will allow them to express their pain. Uh, we're not doing it right, by the way. And there's such a stigma still about it. Most people with a mental health problem are going to work, raising a family, going to school, sometimes doing extraordinary things that we think could never be possible if they had any mental health problems. Um, and I know that's not true. Kevin Love of the Cleveland Cavaliers has been very public about his panic attack. Michael Phelps, who won more gold medals than I can count, he talks about his own depression. Prince Harry, and now he's actually below the radar, uh, talks openly about his own serious depression. And he and his brother William and Kate uh, have done a great deal in, in the British Isles on this topic. So it's starting to change, not as fast as it needs to. That, so by speaking as I have in an odd way, maybe it's helped some others, but it's helped me heal. So it's kind of selfish on one level. Yeah. Uh, so in Cindy Cantrell's article in the most recent issue, you mentioned something um, of, about this card that has the five signs of mental illness on it. Yes. Can people get those somewhere? Uh, they can go. They can go to one or two places. They can go to changedirection.org. That's a national campaign. That's their website. Yeah. Or they can go to Dartmouth Hitchcock's website and punch in react, R-E-A-C-T, which is how do you react to the signs of mental illness. Yeah. Uh, we've given out there. They're about eight and a half inches by three inches. They can print them out. Yeah. Uh, but I, Dartmouth Hitchcock has, has got some light like cardboard cards, and I've given out like, probably 450,000 of them. Hmm. And my goal was to get one on every uh, refrigerator in New England yeah. uh, or every work site in New England or every school classroom door in New England. Because when, when young people or older people see them, they know the person who put that up is not going to judge them or shame them. And we've been doing that for generations. It's just not right at so many levels. Yeah. Hey, speaking of young people, do you sense that, that young people and millennials and whatever the generation is that's coming after millennials, do they think differently about mental illness? Yes. Oh, I love this generation. I mean that sincerely. Uh, that's what gives me great hope. The young people, and I'm going to go as low as sixth graders, hmm. and I speak sixth through twelfth grades, so I'm colleges. They are the least judgmental generation in the history of the United States. And they don't get nearly enough credit, by the way. But they may also be uh, the most played generation with mental health issues in the history of the United States. Uh, these kids want to talk about it. They'll, they'll talk very openly, one-on-one, -on -one, Doug, to me, and I'm the grandfather they've never met. But all it takes is for them to say, and they tell me that, by the way, uh, you seem very honest about this. You're not judging people. I say, I'd be the last person to judge anyone. I was pretty ignorant. I'm not ignorant now. This generation wants to talk about it. Trust me. Schools, public schools and private schools, are much more up the learning curve than most of the rest of us. But there are still a lot of adults, uh, and I'm not even being critical. I'm just being factual, who are still living a bit in yesterday. And uh, older adults, particularly so. And mental illness, as, as we all know, doesn't impact just kids. But it's devastating for them because they don't even know what it is, uh, although they're learning all the time. But older adults uh, suffer too. And because of COVID, a lot of us who didn't think they had mental health problems may have them now. We're more anxious, we're more withdrawn, we're more depressed. It's understandable. But we also need to be braver and smarter. I include myself in that, by the way, because I wasn't very brave or very smart on this topic for most of my adult life, but I am now. Actually, you, you bring up COVID, and that was the big, 
the big topic that I wanted to bring up before I, I see if Lou has any uh, questions for you, because Lou always has questions, is, you know, this this all kind of leads up to 2020, and 2020 has been such an unusual year. I don't have the data in front of me, but I can imagine that it's been extremely tough for people with, with mental illness. Maybe even it's ex exacerbated or it's, it's it, you know, like people are facing these stresses in, in completely new ways. Maybe the support networks aren't there. Maybe the help you mentioned, the you know, the problems of the healthcare system. I'm sure it's put stress on the system, you know, you know as it stands it, it, right it, now. It's put enormous stress on the system. Uh, and I want to share this with your listeners because it stuck with me. The number two person at Dartmouth hit track in psychiatry, he's probably in his late 50s, he graduated from Harvard Medical, he's an amazing man. And we had a public forum uh, on an exhibit called 99 Faces, which hmm. everyone in America, by the way, should see, they go online and see it. Hmm. Um, it's an extraordinary exhibit, but we hosted it at Dartmouth so we could have a discussion, a forum. One month it was on mental health and veterans. Hmm. A huge problem, by the way. We lose 20 veterans a day to suicide oh. in America. Hmm. Uh, we had a, a forum one evening on law enforcement. Uh, one thing I know now but didn't for most of my life is more police officers in America die by suicide every single year than every other cause in the line of duty. Yeah. We had a forum on children, kids. Uh, on the elderly. Anyway, he spoke at one of those forums, and he was asked this question. This is November 2019. How would you rate the mental health system in the United States, doctor? He said, let me answer it this way. The way we treat uh, breast cancer today, not 30 years ago, today, is pretty close to a 10 on a 10-point scale. We get people in quickly. We have really good protocols, and we're really having great results. On that same 10-point scale today, November 19, I would rate the mental health system as a one or a two. Uh, it's hard to get access. We don't have enough providers. Reimbursement rates for mental health counselors and psychiatrists are among the lowest in the world of medicine. Uh, and there's a lot of stigma associated with it. Uh, that's where we are. So because of COVID, a lot of people are feeling isolated, withdrawn, lonely, worried and often with very good reason but we have a culture that says don't talk about that people will think less of you and we have a, a healthcare system in mental health that is hard to access and so we have telehealth and that's my godsend hmm. and medicaid uh, and medicare have been reimbursing that i hope that continues but the basic problem is cultural and unless and until like people are willing to say my mother my father myself, and how come we don't have better mental health care in America? We'll keep hiding it and pretending it's not so bad. Uh, let me share one stat with you that should alarm everybody listening. The rate of suicide in this country for people from the ages of 10 to 24, this is according to the CDC. For that age bracket, the rate of suicide from 2007 to 2017 uh, has increased 56%. And we can say, well, that's interesting, but it's not a problem. If you look where your listeners look up youth risk behavioral surveys, uh, that should make us all pause. Um, most public high schools give those tests. They're CDC administered. Uh, they're anonymous. So kids answer them. All they give is their age their sex, or sexual preference and their year in school. Uh, in one region of New Hampshire on the seacoast, five high schools participated. 47% of the junior girls in those five high schools answered the depression question. Have you been sad or hopeless for two consecutive weeks or longer in the last 12 months such that you haven't been able to engage in normal everyday activity? That's a depression question doesn't use the word. 47% of the junior girls in those five high schools said, yes, I'm depressed. 24% of those junior girls said they've given serious consideration, that's a question, to suicide. 14% said in the last year they've made plans to take their own life. If you read those stats and you think, well, that's okay, 
then you're missing the problem. If 47% of the junior girls had diabetes or leukemia, it would be a public health emergency. And as we know, not always, but often, depression leads to other behaviors. It can lead to non-lethal self-harm. It can lead to suicide. It can lead to drugs and alcohol misuse. Uh, it's a bellwether. It's an announcement there's a problem. And sadly, Doug, if we had a system and a culture that would say that's okay not to be okay, we're here to help. A lot of those kids would get help. The largest providers of mental health services in the United States of America, 2020, are jails and prisons. Think about that for a minute. And it's not that they're doing a great job. It's just we have 2.2 million people there. And many of them, most of them have mental health problems. 65% of the men, as we talk today, 65% of the 1,800 men in the state prison in Concord, New Hampshire, have a diagnosable mental health problem, and they didn't develop it the day after they got there. And if we had a mental health system and people more aware of what it looked like and what was possible, my guess is a lot of those people would have gotten help and might have had a very different life outcome. Yeah. I don't know why we ignore it. it. It's all around us. Sure. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I've heard at least some of those statistics recently in a different context, because I and I don't know what you think about it. I don't know if you've thought about it, but there's a, a documentary on Netflix right now called The Social Dilemma, and it's about social media. And the, the documentary at least tries to make the case that this is connection between um, between use or maybe abuse of or addiction to social media and the rise in depression among young people. And they see that rise that starts after 2010 as when these kids start carrying the cell phones around. Do you, you think there's any merit to that way of, of looking I, at this issue? Absolutely. I think it's extraordinary merit, too. I see it every time we go out and talk to kids. Let me share this one story. Hmm. I was meeting with uh, eight eighth grade girls. I was having lunch with them one day at the school. And and I spoke to the whole school, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And so these four girls had to host me at lunch. So they are like, whose grandfather is this guy? Why is he bothering us? So I had lunch with them, and I said to them, hey, I hear you guys are stressed. Your generation's stressed. Is that true? And suddenly they looked at me like, wow, this guy gets it. And they started smiling. And they said, oh, my God, we're so stressed. I said, why is that? So the girl next to me, who was the athlete of the group, said, I'll tell you what, we're always trying to accomplish the next thing so we'll be eligible to do the thing after that. Mm -hmm. That was not my eighth grade life, by the way. And then I said to them, you guys all have iPhones? <laughs> they looked at me like, are you from a different planet? I knew they all did. And I said, how many hours a day are you on your iPhones? Knowing they wouldn't be honest with me. They were pretty honest. And they were all on their six, seven hours a day. Maybe it's eight, and they wouldn't tell me that. And one little girl that I didn't answer, and I said, how about you? You didn't say anything. She said, I'm on my iPhone one or two hours a day. I said, well, that's very good. Good for you. She said, well, no, it's not that good. I said, what do you mean? She said, if I'm on there longer than that, I get really depressed. Hmm. And, and I know it's true. I hear from high school principals and middle school principals. The Internet world that these kids are living in, I live in myself, by the way, but I can grow up in it. It's not real. It's powerfully important, but it's not real life. And so kids see images of other families, other children. I mean, if you go on Facebook, everybody on Facebook is more exciting than I am. Have you noticed that? <laughs> no one has a picture of themselves in aisle five at Stop and Shop, right? They're in Paris. Or... It's not real life, but I know that. But these kids don't. And the other thing that I just want to mention a couple other things, which are anecdotal, but I believe they're true. I meet with so many kids who come up to me, and they may be 14 or 15 or 16 or 17, but they're always the ones who are struggling three or four years younger in terms of their social age. And I think my generation, which was far from perfect, by the way, the baby boomers, but I grew up in a world where I had a lot of unstructured time. I had, to, I had the benefit of the inefficient use of time. Mm. I played with my friends after school. I'm from a middle-class family, 
my family had dinner together every night. There weren't five-star meals, but they were meals, and I listened to my folks, and they talked to my sister and me. I knew my neighbors, by the way. I knew every house in my neighborhood from the inside. Most people, but I don't even know who's across the street. Uh, I I played Little League baseball. I was a pretty good Little League player, but I was on a traveling team. I, my father wasn't saying, if you got a coach, you could be on the Red Sox. The, the level of stress on these kids is, is unparalleled. And it's not because parents aren't good parents. I'm not saying that. Parents are far more stressed than my parents were. Parents live on the Internet 24-7. When my parents were home, they were home. They were present for me. I didn't have to ask for time. It's just a different universe. I had a little girl, eighth grade girl, like said to me one day, if I don't get a hundred on every paper, I freak out. I said, oh my goodness, you gotta have a lower standard than that. She said, what do you mean? I said, my goal was 85. If I hit that, I was home. Don't worry about it. I said, I got 500s in my high school career. She said, how do you know that? I said, I well, only five of them. It's not hard to remember five. And if I had your standard, I would have quit in my sophomore year. I still don't understand geometry. These kids are pressured to get to the next level. And so I think we need to have a cultural moment where we say, wait a minute, we may be well-intentioned, but these kids are stressed. And sadly, the adults in their world uh, have something to do with that. Yeah. So uh, before I, I throw this open to Lou, if people are interested in more information, they're hearing this and they're like, ah, I want to do something or I want to learn more. I need to get help. Uh, you, they can go to the Dartmouth Hitchcock dot uh, org website and look up react program. Is that the best way to find the information? It, it is actually. And, you know, in the in the in my former life, when the pandemic wasn't making appearances impossible, uh, I, I have not turned down, at least to my knowledge, any invitation to speak. Now, I would do it every day, Doug, if I could. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, the pandemic obviously has changed that. And I miss the kids. Uh, and I worry about those kids. Mm -hmm. We just need to say, as we've said with cancer and AIDS and ALS and so many other afflictions, can we finally have an adult conversation about it? Can we finally be honest? Can we stop shaming people or blaming people? And that's what I'm trying to do. And I know it's a big lift, and for one person it's probably impossible. But it's not impossible for all of us. If enough people say, that guy is right, I agree with that, by the way. What are we doing about this in my school, in my town? What are we doing about it in law enforcement or first responders? We'll change it because people usually do the right thing when they have the facts. But we've been living in a, in a world of misinformation on mental illness since the earth was flat. It's time it end. Hmm. Lou, do you have questions for our guest? No, I have 100 questions, but I know we're under a time constraint here. Uh, I appreciate meeting you today, and I, I've, enjoyed, uh, I've enjoyed your discussion. And I think I know the answer to this first question based on the last couple answers that you've given me. But you've used the word culture several times. And in today's society, when we deal with mental health issues or uh, health issues in general, we look for a pill. Uh, we look for a pharmaceutical answer, and if that's not there, we look for a governmental answer. And my question is, is there a governmental answer to this? In other words, uh, is the mental health challenge something that can be addressed by a government program? Uh, is there, does it lend itself to the institutions that we use to run the country? Or I'm guessing the way you've termed it cultural to this point, this has to be done in the home, this has to be done at the dinner table, this has to be done on a personal level and less an uh, institutional level. Uh, actually, I think it needs to be done in both places. Uh, by cultural, I mean we have always hidden it, we've been ashamed of it, we've been afraid of it. Uh, and so people therefore respond to that stimulus, which is they don't talk about it. So we need to start a conversation around our kitchen table, our dining room table, uh, our workroom at the office, um, in our neighborhoods, in our schools. But beyond that, I'll give you an example of how the government could help. Uh, we don't reimburse insurance companies, don't reimburse mental health professionals at the rate they reimburse orthopedists or neurologists. Well, why is that? Uh, in New Hampshire, for example, we have 10 community mental health centers, which are the lifeblood of, of mental health treatment. 
but New Hampshire has one of the lowest uh, Medicaid reimbursement rates of any state in America. Uh, that's a governmental function that could change. Uh, uh, businesses in this country, businesses writ large, they lose upwards of two hundred billion, with a B, dollars a year uh, because of mental health and substance misuse, because they train people who don't stay, uh, or they have high turnover rates because of mental illness. Or somebody at your workplace has a mental health problem or family member, so they don't come to work to take care of them, and they don't talk about it much. Uh, workplaces could be provided wellness programs. They could provide better insurance for mental health care. They could provide yoga classes. For, a lot that we can do. It, it's You know, when Hillary Clinton ran for president, she was much criticized for saying it takes a village to raise a child. Well, I have news for everyone. If they don't appreciate it, it does take a village. It takes a neighborhood. It takes a family. It takes a church community. Uh, if you're part of a religious group, there are so many people that touch your lives. And if they were to do it in this world and learn about it, as I have, not because I'm smart. I wasn't smart. Tech. So my ignorance brought me to a bad place, but uh, it's opened my eyes now. And so we all need to talk about it. Yes, the government can help. The government's not the only answer. And medication, in many cases, is either not the only answer or not the right answer. So there's no silver bullet, but it's a cultural shift, just as it was on cancer. When I was a child, my mother used to whisper the word cancer. Now people say, I have breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Look at the change. When the Patriots start wearing green, that's the color for mental health, by the way, <laughs> then we'll know we've gone to the next level. Uh, Every, everyone listening knows the, uh, the color for breast cancer awareness. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows that color. Most people don't even know that mental health has a color. Mm -hmm. That's cultural. When we know that, because we care that we know that, then we'll be making changes everywhere. Sometimes it starts right at home. Uh, let me ask you about the front lines of this and take advantage of your unique perspective, both professionally and personally, about this. How does the criminal justice system reconcile itself with, to borrow a phrase from addiction, the dual diagnosis of mental illness? Because often they're dealing with mental illness. Can they get involved in mental illness in a preventative measure? Or is the crime the red line between the criminal justice system and what should be a mental health system? Well, so, sometimes it is, but the, the court system, by the way, is the last place you want to go to deal with mental health, other than uh, the legislature could recognize that some offenses should be treated in the first instance with mental health counseling uh, or even inpatient care that really is, aren't, aren't in the statute. Judges don't get to make up these sentences. Uh, in my state, when I was chief justice, we expanded mental health courts for nonviolent offenders. And so if you committed a nonviolent crime, uh, but it was pretty clearly driven by mental health issues, uh, and you qualified, we would get you into a program that was outpatient. And you'd come every week or every two weeks. Uh, you'd see a counselor that want to make sure you were doing what was required. And if substance misuse was involved, that you were not drinking, they'd be drug testing these people. And you had to do work in the community and then ultimately get a job. And that has been very successful. We call drug courts and mental health courts. But they are also not able, given the resources the courts have. The reason those courts exist in those forms is because society has not stepped up. And the irony is, by not doing what I'm suggesting, which has become a little more proactive when people are younger, Half of all mental illness begins like, by age 14, half. Uh, so if we have better mental health treatment available in families and our schools and our communities, uh, we would be saving money on the back end. And so by letting folks just go on unaided and some of them end up in prison, we pay for that at 50, 60 grand a year per inmate or untreated, undiagnosed mental illness causes many more physical ailments, which we all are willing to pay for because we can see those. We spend a lot of money in this country because of not understanding mental illness, and most importantly, not understanding what's possible 
with mental health. The earlier you find it, the earlier the intervention, usually the more successful we will be. And you can change lives. The other thing I've learned in my own family, you change one life that's suffering with mental health, you're going to change every life that loves that life. It multiplies out. Trust me, every parent in America knows what I'm saying is true. Uh, or every parent with a grandparent who's living in their home knows that what I'm saying is true. But it requires us to be mature about it, hmm. like we are. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, if I said I had AIDS, people would want to leave the room. They wouldn't know if they breathed the same air, whether they could be sick. And so we're more grown up on it now. So I might say to you, my future employer, I have HIV, and you'd say, John, are you taking the cocktail? How's that working for you? But I probably wouldn't come to my job interview, Doug, and say, you know, I'm clinically depressed. Hmm. That would be a game changer. Right. Why? Why is that? That's what I'm talking about when I say cultural change. Yeah. Well, on that very important note, if people want to learn more about John Broderick and the, the REACT program, they can turn to the most recent issue of Merrimack Valley Magazine. It's the one with the uh, the women leaders on the cover. Um, the website's there. Maybe somebody's already posted in the Stevens comments. Stephen's posted it. In the okay, section. okay. So you can yeah. look in the comments section of, if you're watching this on Facebook Live, to find out more about the REACT program and Dartmouth-Hitchcock and, and the sort of work they're doing. John, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Doug. My challenge, by the way, is that every hospital in America step up mm. on this topic. It's, and they need, they need federal funding and reimbursement to do it. It's critically important. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, John. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Doug. Okay. Lou, see you next week. See you next week.